scientists discovered how to edit the human genome using CRISPR technology, we've been able to cure various genetic diseases. But this achievement only represents one side of the CRISPR coin. The two types of genome editing are called somatic and germline. Essentially, somatic editing only affects the person whose genes are being altered. The second type is germline, which has garnered a lot of fear. It still changes the genes of the patient, but it also changes the reproductive cells, meaning that the patient's future generations will be genetically altered as well. When you start manipulating genes that then can be passed on to future generations, you're changing the basic nature of life. And so I think we have to be very careful and think about what our capabilities are and how far we should go. That's Dr. Neil Baer, a lecturer at Harvard Medical School and Yale School of Public Health, as well as the editor of a new book called The Promise and Peril of CRISPR. It's a collection of essays from bioethicists, philosophers, and geneticists on CRISPR. There are a lot of moral, ethical, and policy concerns surrounding this technology. For one, should we have the ability to manipulate evolution? Some scientists have argued that modern creations like coats and vaccines have pushed human evolution forward, but Bear believes that CRISPR takes it to a whole other level. Changing the human genome is very different from wearing jackets or taking antibiotics in the sense that evolution and natural selection take millennia to occur. And so wearing jackets in cold weather isn't necessarily going to change evolution overnight. But we can change evolution overnight in some ways if we start doing germline editing. Despite its incredible potential, there are just a few regulations in place, which change country to country. In America, somatic editing is allowed. It's even been used to cure sickle cell disease, though the treatment runs patients around $3 million. Germline editing, however, is banned for research that uses public funds, which accounts for a significant portion of investigations. Still, there are no laws against doing it in a privately funded lab. In fact, scientists at Columbia University used CRISPR to remove genetic blindness from embryos, and researchers at Oregon Health and Science University deleted a gene that causes a fatal heart condition. Both cases were used solely for research purposes, and neither had the embryos carried to term. Bear says many scientists believe the regulations should be decided by the scientific community, but are the potential mistakes of self-governance worth the progress? I've had scientists tell me that they can because they'll just make the scientists who do things that are wrong pariahs. But, you know, if you do something wrong, like, say, make something that's more transmissible, like maybe bird flu, the outcome isn't really going to equal just you know, wagging your finger at them. It's a terrible outcome. Aside from federal guidelines, a 2015 international summit decided that it would be irresponsible to use germline editing on humans since there's so many unknown safety issues. However, it also stated that this decision should be reviewed as the field continues to advance. Despite this ruling, a Chinese doctor took matters into his own hands in 2018. He genetically altered the embryos of twin girls to make them resistant to HIV and was imprisoned for three years. Unfortunately, there's not much information on the health of the twins today. We do know that these girls are mosaics. I think that that's been reported that they don't fully have it in every cell, but in many of their cells. And also we don't know when we start to tinker with changing receptors we do know, for instance, that people who had the mutation for the HIV receptor didn't get HIV or AIDS, you know, in the 80s or 90s, and they were very fortunate. But we also know that they're more susceptible to other things, I think like West Nile virus. So, you know, evolution has occurred to support life. And when you start to play with things like that, edit things like Dr. Hood did, the outcomes may not be predictable. Which is the main argument against germline editing. There are so many unknowns when changing human DNA. The price of cutting out a genetic disease could be equally deadly, but we wouldn't even know until the child is born and the damage done. However, the other side of the argument is that many necessary advancements in the past had unknown risks, but pushing forward was positive for society. An essay in Bear's book talked about how in vitro fertilization was met with a lot of hesitation when it was first announced. 
We all fretted about in vitro. We fretted about sex selection. We fretted about all these things and it really didn't come to pass. So are we over fretting about germline editing? Though Bear doesn't think so, this argument points out the complexities of this issue. What are human beings? What does it mean to be human? Should we have the ability to start to, you know, finesse humanity? We seem to be getting closer and closer to these answers with each new study. In fact, Bear says the community began to rethink its 2015 statement after the Chinese researchers' experiment. They started to say, hmm, maybe there are times when we should do germline editing. The example that's being used now is the parents or the partners are both deaf and they have a genetic deafness that will be passed on to their offspring. And if both parents have that gene, their children will be deaf. And so some Russian researchers, there's a Russian geneticist has said, that's not fair to these parents. If they want a hearing child, we should be able to give them a hearing child. Well, the only way we can give them a hearing child is to not do it somatically once the child is born, but do it when they're an embryo. While there's still the risk of off-target consequences, Carol Patton, who was born deaf, writes about a second idea to consider. She doesn't see herself as having something pathological. She sees her deafness as something that is just part of her, and that's who she is, and she doesn't want to be cured. And who gets to draw the line between what's acceptable and what's not? In Denmark, women can have, or pregnant people can have, a genetic test for Down syndrome. And so they have probably the lowest rate of Down syndrome now in the world because people often decide to abort the fetus or if they're having pre-implantation, they won't implant that embryo that has Down syndrome. So where do you draw the line and where are you, you know, who is one to say whether that person should be allowed to live or not to exist? Some arguments say that using CRISPR to eliminate non-life-threatening genetic syndromes is simply a high-tech version of eugenics. What does it mean to improve? Whose notion of improvement are we thinking about? Are we thinking about someone who doesn't want to have a Down syndrome child? Are we thinking about someone who does? Where do we draw the line? And so I think those questions about, you know, so-called enhancement improvement and having an agreement on what kind of things should be improved is very worrisome. And even if we move past the ethics to limiting diversity within the human population, the ability to modify and exponentially increase human potential could take us down some dangerous paths. So for instance, we know of children who are born without the ability to feel pain. Well, we could conceivably make soldiers, apparently China and Russia are investigating this, that don't have pain or maybe don't have fear, or maybe have to sleep less. This is all kind of futuristic with enhancement. And so, you know, it's like for intelligence or strength or whatever, you know, that's, I don't know if we'll ever be able to do that. But for pain, fear, maybe sleep, people who need less sleep, and we can, you know, if we learn what genes they have that make them different, conceivably we could do that. With so many unanswered questions and unknown risks to gene editing, there's no telling when or even if CRISPR should be used at its fullest potential. However, since we already have the technology in hand, the path forward seems almost inevitable. How do we protect humankind and animal kind and plants, you know, from whatever scientists or rogue scientists want to do? Bear's book, The Promise and Peril of CRISPR, is available now. You can find more information about Dr. Neil Baer and all of our guests on our website, RadioHealthJournal.org. For more behind the scenes, follow Radio Health Journal on Facebook, Instagram, and X. Our writer-producer is Kristen Farah. Our production manager is Jason Dickey. I'm Greg Johnson. 